So we're very pleased today to have both the publisher and the editor of the Washington Post. And everybody who wants to ask a question about the Washington Post, this will be your chance. I'll ask a number, but we'll have some opportunity for people here to ask as well. Let me introduce our, our uh, guest today. Uh, immediately on my left is Catherine Weymouth. Catherine is the uh, president of the Washington Post uh, Media, but also publisher, in effect, of the Washington Post. Um, she is somebody who joined the Washington Post in 1996 as an assistant counsel and worked her way up. And before she became the president of the Washington Post, the publisher of the Washington Post in 2008, she had served a number of capacities, including in charge of advertising for the Washington Post. She, uh, before that, from 1993 to 1996, was a lawyer at Williams and Connolly. She's a graduate of Stanford Law School and Harvard College, magna cum laude. And uh, she, um, among other things, is the person in charge of the business side, you could say, of the Washington Post. That's often what the publisher is thought to do, but oversees the editorial side in some respects, as we'll talk about. Marty Barron. Uh, Marty is relatively new to Washington in the sense that uh, he joined the Washington Post as executive editor, the top editor, in the beginning of this year, but a wealth of experience in editorial kinds of positions. Previously had edited for 11 and a half years the Boston Globe, which under his leadership won six Pulitzer Prizes. Previously he served in senior positions at the Los Angeles Times, Miami Herald, and um, also the New York Times. He is a native of Tampa and a graduate of Lehigh with a uh, BA and an MBA. I think I got that right? Okay. So let me start, if I could, with Catherine. Um, your grandmother was a famous uh, publisher of the Washington Post, and, and uh, your grandfather was a publisher before that. So as you were growing up, did you feel any pressure from the family to go into the family business, or, <laughs> or was there no pressure? There was no pressure. It really didn't cross my mind, and I was voted in high school most likely to become publisher of the New York Post. <laughs> Tells you a lot about what I like to read. So, um, well, I like to read that too, but um, so, uh, but you, so in other words, you, you practiced law for a number of years at Williams Connolly, but then what drifted you towards the Washington Post where there was just, you thought you would like to fulfill a family obligation or just interested in publishing or what hap happened? No, I guess Don started to talk to me about the Post and my grandmother did when I was in law school and I was honored that they would think of bringing me into the fold. They'd always made clear that you had to be qualified. You had to have skills to come in. It's not just a gimme as a family member. Um, I had grown up around the news and politics, um, but I had always expected to, be, to stay a lawyer. I wanted to become a prosecutor. Um, so it was more of an accident. A partner at Williams and Connolly, after I had just finished a trial with a partner, sent around an email saying, to all the associates, the Washington Post is short-staffed and the legal staff. We have agreed to lend them an associate for three months. It will not be held against you on partner track. Is anybody interested? And I thought, oh, that's perfect. I can dip my toe in, no commitment. You know, I thought, what if I'm terrible at it and they fire me, that'd be so embarrassing. What if I don't like it and I leave? So that was a perfect way. I called up the partner and said, what about me? And he laughed. And the, but the deal was I could come back after three months and then, of course, 16 years later, here I am. Still there. So tell people who may not be familiar, what does the publisher of the newspaper actually do? It's a great question, and the best answer I ever heard was from another publisher who said, I pubble. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great question. My eight-year-old daughter the other day said to me, Mommy, why do you read the newspaper in the morning? Don't you know everything that's in it already from the day before? <laughs> I said, no, no, that's the editor's job. And she said, well, then what do you do? And I said, that's a great question. I'm in meetings all day. And she said, what do you do in those meetings? And I was like, that is a good question, too. Um, no, but the truth is, I think it's my job to work with a, the team, including Marty on the business side, to set the strategy for the company, get barriers out of people's way, hire the best editor in the country, and let okay. him run the newsroom. And uh, today, the biggest problem facing all big city newspapers, I assume, is getting paid for the news that you produce. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the Washington Post strategy on, let's say, getting paid on the internet for what you produce? And how has that worked so far? And what are you likely to do in the future in that area? Yeah, that is the central question, right? I mean, we are a mission-driven business. My family has always firmly believed that good journalism and good business go hand in hand. Um, what people don't really realize is that we never really got paid for the news. It was 
We got paid for the bundle and the distribution, right. and as Warren Buffett would describe it, we used to have, in the good old days that I missed, a moat, right? I mean, it was effectively a monopoly. Right. If you were an advertiser and you wanted to reach Washington, and we have many wonderful advertisers in the room, um, you were basically going to buy the post. It was the most effective way to reach Washington, and it still is, mind you. Um, <laughs> but it really was about a 40 to 50 year period where it was incredibly profitable, where the competition basically went away other than local TV and whatnot. You know, when my great-grandfather bought the Washington Post, he bought it in 1933 at a bankruptcy sale for $833,000, which was $2 million less than he had offered for it two years prior. And it lost money every year from 1933 until 1950 was the first year that it broke even. And mind you, this is a private company at the time. These are his own this is his own money. He lost millions and millions of dollars. My grandmother wrote in her book that in 1947, her father was as happy as a little boy because for the first time, the Washington Post was only going to lose $2 million. Mm -hmm. So the monopoly is broken. You know, that's fine. And we produce, I think, the best news and analysis in the country. Um, and that matters to people. And in this age where we're all flooded with information, much of which we don't know how, how well we can trust it or not, we're making a bet and we believe that quality matters more than ever. People come to us when they want to understand a news event, what it means, how is it going to affect my life, et cetera. And we still have, we are, we have the number one penetration of any major metro in the country. Maybe because we're a geeky area, I don't know. But um, we actually have more readers between 18 and 35 who read the Washington Post than go to Starbucks in a given month. Really? I swear to God, that is based on a neutral study. So we're in a great position. It's true. I know people okay. say young people don't read papers, but they do. But if, if um, I want to, I'm online, I want to, let's say I'm traveling and I want to read the Washington Post a year from now or two years from now, am I going to have to pay for that online? Yes, yes you will, and you'll be happy to. It, it will be worth it, David. I'm, I'm looking forward to paying. I hope it's, <laughs> I hope it's affordable. I'm sure it will be. So, think, Marty. I think it'll be okay, okay for you. Okay. All right. Marty, um, you grew up in Florida. And uh, what propelled you to want to go into journalism? You didn't, uh, nice Jewish family. They didn't say, <laughs> why don't you go to medical school or law school or something like that? Probably. Um, what, how did you, what did you, when your family, you told your family you're going to be a journalist, what did they say? They said, great, or I assume they did, but... Uh, well, they were okay with it for the first year or two, but afterwards they did say, why aren't you going to law school like all your right. friends? Are, and uh, I think that's what they wanted from me. Uh, but my family was one that uh, read the paper every morning. It was part of the ritual. They watched the news at night, uh, the local news first, and then they watched the Huntley-Brinkley report. Mm -hmm. And then we would watch 60 Minutes on, on Sunday. And news and interest in public affairs was just part of our, our daily life. And I think through that, I got interested in it and became interested in what it was they were doing every morning looking at this newspaper, which I myself was reading then. And so I was keenly interested in, in, in doing what, uh, what I was reading, essentially. OK, so you're minding your own business. You're 11 and a half years, you're at the Boston Globe, a nice city, and so forth. What propelled you to want to leave Boston and come to Washington? Right. Well, first of all, as a journalist, I definitely was not minding my own business. Um, I was minding everybody else's business. But um, um, as you know, that's my job. But um, uh, I was in Boston for 11 and a half years. It was a terrific run. Uh, and I have great admiration and fondness for the people I worked with there. And great, I'm very proud of the work that we did during those 11 and a half years and the work that they've done since uh, in the Boston bombing, which I'm also proud of what they've done since. Uh, but this was an opportunity to work in an institution that has had a singular role in American politics and in American journalism. I think there's probably no other institution that has inspired more journalists than the Washington Post. And it was an institution that had inspired me when I was getting into the field in the 1970s as well. And it's an opportunity to, to work at the national and international level, not just occasionally, but uh, every single day. And I think if this is the greatest center of power in the world, I think if there were a capital of the world, uh, Washington is the capital okay. of the world. Uh, so it's an opportunity to practice journalism and essentially the capital of the world. So every day, is it your job to decide what's going to be in the front page of the newspaper the next day? Do you work that out? And how late during the day do you figure out what's going to be in the front page the next day? And you do you pick the lead article every day? Is that part of your well, job? Well, I participate in that discussion. We have other people. It's a collaborative. Uh, every day, keep in mind, the newspaper is a collaborative process and a collective process. So we have meetings where we decide that. We are meeting for that decision. The initial meeting is uh, 
uh, essentially at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But obviously, that's very early. Everything can change. And out of that meeting, we, we come up with other, other ideas. And then news never stops. It's something that goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And uh, everything, is, everything is changeable at any hour of the day or night, as a matter of fact. So uh, you know, we make those preliminary decisions then. But then we come to different conclusions. Sometimes when we've read a story and, we, and then another story develops, we, we, we can tear everything up and start all over again. So um, as between the two of you, uh, who actually makes the decision on endorsing candidates? Is that the business side, the editorial side? Who actually makes those decisions? Don. Don. <laughs> uh, actually, <laughs> the editorial page editor, right. Fred Hyatt, makes that decision. Mm -hmm with Don and me, but okay. he actually still reports to Don. Okay. And um, during the, the day, um, do you, each of you talk very much during the day about problems, or are you each in your church and state, you're not allowed to talk very much? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I just want to point out that I have nothing to do with the editorials. We keep a strict separation between the news side and but the But if you saw somebody page. in the men's room and you say, well, I, I have an idea, here's a good editorial, they No, I actually don't. Uh, <laughs> I actually don't. Uh, uh, so I don't, I actually don't talk to them about their editorials okay. uh, whatsoever. So, uh, but as far as, um, uh, well, there's no church state division between the two of us because uh, she's my boss. <laughs> so she's in charge of both uh, the business side as well as the editorial okay. side. And uh, so there's no church state division there. There is a church state division, if you want to call it that, between uh, other people in the business operations okay. and, and us. But, we, of course, have to work uh, with the business side. You can't, we're part of a business. We're not independent of the business. And so we try to work collaboratively. And there are certain things that, certain areas where they, don't, they certainly don't tell us what to write. Okay. And I don't tell them how to sell advertising either. Suppose I, let's say, have an idea for a good story for you, and I'm a business person or I'm a public relations person. Could I call you up and say, here's an idea for a story? And you get lobbied all the time, or you basically try to avoid people lobbying you about stories? Uh, no, I, well, uh, both. Uh, I, uh, I get lobbied all the time, lobbied. and I try to avoid being lobbied all the time about <laughs> stories. But, um, so, but I'm always happy to hear ideas. Uh, we, sitting in our offices, we can't possibly have all the ideas. The whole, the whole notion is that we should be out in the community, hearing what people have to say, talking to people in business and government, uh, people who are involved in non-governmental organizations, ordinary citizens, talk to everybody across the entire range of uh, our, uh, our coverage and hear from them what they think the stories are. And I would just add that a lot of people say, oh, I really want you guys to do a story about my company. I say, no, you really probably don't. Okay. If you're on the front page of the Washington Post with your company, it's probably not a good story. So uh, the Washington Post became very famous for uh, Watergate. That was an epic moment in journalism. Uh, do you think it's possible today for the Washington Post or any newspaper to kind of bring down a government effect by uh, writing stories, or you think there's too many other competing sources for news, and a newspaper itself can't have the same impact as it did in 1973 and 4? Uh, there's no question that we have the capacity to do the same thing that was done uh, in Watergate. Uh, the Washington Post and other newspapers embark on very ambitious uh, investigative journalism all the time. Uh, the Post, just this past this year, was a finalist for a, a Pulitzer in the public service category for flaws in, in evidence and criminal prosecutions by the Justice Department. So uh, that was a major project, a major investment of resources. In Boston, we embarked on a major investigation of, the, of abuse within the Catholic Church and whether uh, the Archdiocese in Boston was ignoring that abuse and reassigning priests and essentially allowing them to abuse again. And that, of course, has had had a huge impact in the Archdiocese of Boston, but it had an impact across the country and across the world. So if you look at, uh, if you just look at the Pulitzer Prizes and the finalists for the Pulitzer Prize, you see that newspapers all the time are doing that kind of investigation. And pretty much they're the only journalistic institutions that are doing that sort of okay. deep investigative work. So Catherine, you have about 500,000 daily subscribers to the Washington Post, but you have 700,000 on Sunday. So what are those 200,000 on Sunday doing during the rest of the week? Where, 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 are, they, where are they? Where are they getting their news? How come you don't have 700,000 during the week? Well, I should add, we have like 19 million online. Um, during the week, I, I think the Sunday reader is different. For starters, the people have a little more time on Sunday. Um, and a lot of people get the part of the Sunday paper delivered on Saturday. Plus, we have the coupons in there, which I know you would prefer that's to my, throw that's out. That's what I buy. I buy it just <laughs> The advertisers for that. out there didn't hear that. 
Um, but yeah, a lot of people get the paper for TV Week and the magazine okay. and the coupons, and because they want to sit back, it's much more of a sit back reading okay. experience. So uh, today, um, it used to be the case that at classified advertising was a really profitable business, and Craigslist came along and hurt all newspapers a bit. Um, have you ever been able to figure out a way to recover that kind of classified advertising business, or has that largely gone away to the Craigslist or other things like, like that? I, I think it has permanently changed. We, we invested heavily in building our own online classified verticals, and we are the lead salespeople for cars.com. We have the number one job site in Washington. Um, so part of it is secular, right? Part of it is the economy. People are not hiring a lot. You're not going to have a big job section when people are not hiring. But a lot of it is just the world has changed, right? We pretty much, the roommate business is gone, the pet business is gone, yard sales are gone. Um, so I don't know. I don't think that money has come back. I think the model has changed. Uh, you're, uh, you've announced you're moving your offices. I think you've been on 15th Street for quite a while, and um, you're moving. Do you, have you announced where you're moving to? Nope. Lots of people, including lots of people in our building, are lobbying me. Can we move two blocks from my house, right. please? And the reason you're moving is the space you're in now is very expensive space, relatively speaking. Is that it? Well, we own the building, so right. we're not paying rent. Uh, I think is the building is old. It's outdated. Our needs have changed, and it would be nice to be in a light, airy, more efficient space. Um, and so I, th I think it's time. You know, the post used to be on E Street. It moved, right? And now that our printing presses aren't in the building anymore, we're not tied to that building. Okay. What is the most popular feature in the Washington Post, would you say, based on surveys or based on people coming up and talking to you, who is the most popular columnist or writer, or what's the most popular feature that you have? Well, I think that's hard to say, but probably Tom Boswell would be classified as the most popular writer in the paper. Uh, he draws a huge audience, and uh, both online and in print. Uh, and there are others who are very popular. Ezra Klein, who does Want Blog and writes a column as well, is uh, hugely popular. And is Tom Heath, who's most, here and Tom in the Heath room. here, very popular as well. So, uh, you know, we have a, um, a number of people, but it's hard to pick one person. So when you pick up the newspaper the in the morning, what do you turn to first? Uh, well, I look at the front page again for about the 15th time uh, and evaluate it again. Uh, then I tend to look at all the, our section fronts uh, again uh, because I've looked at them the previous night. And then I start making my way into the okay. interior of the paper. I, I usually look at the obituaries first to see. <laughs> whether I'm in there or not or anything, but see whether they run a premature yeah. obituary of me. But, um, and what do you read first? We're going to try to avoid that, by the right. way. Okay. Premature obituary. Well, I, my habits have changed a lot, and uh, what I find is I actually read it on my iPad the night before, and it comes out around 10 or 11, and then I read the paper in the morning to see what's new or what I've missed, and I start with the front page. So the Post, actually, you can buy the Post at night the night before, right? It's called the Bulldog Edition. You still do that, or...? Well, no, the, the edition I'm reading on the iPad is our actual, actual one. newspaper. But physically, somebody can go buy it at night, the night before? On the Used Saturday be. paper. The Sunday paper okay. you can buy in a Bulldog edition on Saturday. Uh, okay. And today, uh, all big city newspapers are struggling with the issue we talked about, the Internet. Um, do you think anybody has actually found a very good model yet for how to get paid for the news you write and get on the Internet? Has anybody really had a very good paywall that's worked yet, in your view? I think everybody is experimenting and will continue to experiment. Uh, Walter Hussman in Arkansas um, was the first newspaper to put up a hard paywall. And what's interesting is that at the time he did this, he did this pretty much immediately. Everybody laughed at him as sort of archaic. He didn't get the internet. You know, information wants to be free, people were saying. And he was saying, I don't care. I want people to buy my paper. Well, now he looks like a genius. Um, so I think everyone's experimenting. You're seeing all kinds of different paywalls. We're launching a meter, sort of like the New York Times did uh, in, over the summer. Some people have hard paywalls. You know, I think everybody's experimenting. And, but it is a mission-driven business. We want to find a way, you know, doing great journalism costs money. I mean, Bob Woodward was teaching a class, and he said he asked the class, you know, if, if you guys were going to, if Watergate happened today, how do, how do you guys think you would cover it? And they were like, yeah, I'd just go on the internet and I'd just like look at Wikipedia and I'd go to the banks and I'd just write it up. And he's like, I mean, you don't understand how much le leather work goes into doing an investigative series like you were talking about. That costs money, right? I mean, our bureau in Baghdad at the height of the Iraq war cost a million dollars a year. Not because of the reporters, but because of the security we have right. in place. 
um, you know, and I was on a panel with Ariana Huffington, and somebody asked her, like, Ariana, are you going to open up a Baghdad bureau? And she's like, you know, no, darling, you know, why would I? It's the link economy. <laughs> Um, which is totally fair, but, you know, who's footing the bill? Um, you could get paid for that imitation. <laughs> Whatever um, uh, So, right now, how many foreign bureaus do you have? Any? Yeah, we have about 14 active 14, bureaus. Yeah, still we have about 15. Yeah. 15, 15 foreign bureaus. Okay, wow. You realize you had that many. And today, since you've been publisher, uh, what's been the most embarrassing thing that happened to you? It's not the one you guys think it is. I will tell you the biggest mistake I made very early in my career as publisher, back in that we actually had too many pages, which has not happened in a long time. And I got a call from the production people at 8 o'clock at night on a Saturday. And the guy's like, Catherine, we have too many pages. We're publishing the mega job section, back when it was mega. And we literally have too many pages to print. So what do you want me to do? We need to eliminate two pages. And I did what I had learned to do best, which is say, well, Hugh, what would you recommend? And he said, well, you know, I would take out the obits, two pages of obits. We can publish those on Monday. And I was like, that sounds good. I mean, they're dead. That's cool. We publish it on Monday. <laughs> and oh my God, did I learn. I didn't realize that people put all the memorial service times in there. And I had to write 48 handwritten apology notes to those right. people. So you won't do that again? No, I won't do that again. And now I know that's the first thing you read anyway. I agree. <laughs> uh, it is. So, not the paid part, but uh, the, the, uh, what's the most embarrassing thing that happened to you in your journalism career? Did you ever make a big mistake in writing something or editing something? Uh, uh, yes, I've had my share of mistakes. We had, in Boston, we had a hoax perpetrated on us. Uh, it was a pretty serious one related to the big dig, and uh, that was a serious problem. Because you, you had a hoax about the big dig? Or? Uh, somebody, somebody who was involved in, uh, who was a supervisor, uh, actually uh, wrote a, uh, uh, fabricated a memo. Uh, he spoke pu publicly. He was he had his name identified with it and all of that. And people said people said he was a credible person. And in fact, he had worked on the project and all oh. of that. Warning of problems with the big dig, and it turned out that that was not the I that see. was not the case. He had, um, he had fabricated the memo for reasons that nobody can now under, can understand. So, n to journalists that might be in the audience, prospective journalists or people watching, uh, would you recommend today to young people that they go into journalism, and what would you say is the greatest appeal of going into it? I would recommend that people go into journalism. Uh, I always like to remind people that when I got into it uh, full-time in 1976, it was a, there was a national recession going on. It was a bad year for it was a bad year for newspapers, and I say it's been a bad year every year since, and I made an entire career out of it. Uh, so, um, so I think people getting into the field now will probably have a similar experience. Uh, that uh, what's happening now is that uh, if you just look at traditional uh, media venues uh, like just print newspapers, you see that the job opportunities are diminished. But if you actually look at what's happening on the web, there's an explosion of opportunities. And for young people who are interested in journalism, who have the proper skills, uh, the multimedia skills that they need these days, uh, there are in innumerable opportunities and very exciting opportunities to tell stories in new ways. So today, the, where is the Washington Post printed? You print it where? At our plant in Springfield, Virginia. All right, so then it's trucked to all places. Yep. And how many you know, newspaper boys or girls do you have actually delivering this? Is it tens of thousands around? Or? No more newspaper boys or girls, no but um, we have... People don't... Del who, who delivers it to the house? Or? The, the carriers. Okay. So we have about under 100 distributors, and then they hire. They run their own businesses. They hire carriers, and they get it to your doorstep. And today, um, if you were looking at the Washington Post as a, as a business, would you say the best place to put your money in future developing of the Washington Post would be what area? Would it be more news or would it be more better distribution or in new printing plants? Where would you allocate capital? Where's the best place to get the best bang for the buck now? We're looking at, um, like for example, we've invested millions of dollars this year in video, which is a really exciting space for us. It's the first time that as a newspaper we can sort of disrupt the TV space. We have more reporters on the street than any local news or, um, and so we're 
doing a big video push that will launch in June. We've also done a lot of sort of startup businesses. We've launched a conference business like lots of media organizations have that's been tremendously successful. We have like little Angie's lists called servicealley.com. We have our local business publication that I'm sure you all subscribe to, Capital Business, just a little plug. Tom Heath writes for it brilliantly. <laughs> um, so we're, we're sort of innovating and take, thinking about what are our assets, what makes strategic sense for us, and we're investing there. Okay. So um, how many journalists does the Post actually have these days? Uh, well, when you're uh, by journalists, I'm talking about reporters, photographers, editors, uh, graphics artists, designers, everybody, videographers, everything. Uh, we have over 600 in, in the newsroom. Which is almost double what we had when Watergate broke. You have twice as many as when Watergate broke. Okay. But when somebody, um, very often newspapers today have buyouts where you get, let's say, older journalists um, and you kind of say to them. Not necessarily. No age no, discrimination. And no age discrimination. You get younger middle age or younger or older people you say maybe you should take a buyout um, today is that a trend that you think is going to continue where you're buying out journalists or or do you think basically the, the last wave of that is we've largely seen that I actually should say that I think we're lucky to be able to offer the buyouts to people and many people are very grateful and it's thanks to Warren Buffett having invested our pension. We have the, over, the only significantly overfunded pension plan that I know of in the business. Um, you know, I think it will depend on what happens in the world, but uh, it'd be nice if the economy ever came back. Could you work on that? Um, but I think there's no question we will have to continue to cut costs. I mean, we, we are a business. We are a mission-driven business, but we are a business, and we have always believed that it is important for us to remain independent. So any, any uh, increase in the price of the, uh, the, the paper? Are you planning anything you want to announce today? or no, no, we just had a price increase in January for single copy, so subscribe at home and you get a lovely discount. Um, and, you know, as of June, if you subscribe to the paper, you get all the digital package for free. Really? Yeah. Okay. So you're going to start, right? Uh, tomorrow. Right? Yeah. Maybe right today. That's good. So, and uh, how many, and what does it cost to buy the paper today? If you buy it at a newsstand? If you buy it at a newsstand, I don't even know because I get it at home, a dollar? Dollar and a quarter. Dollar and a quarter. Dollar and a quarter. And but Sundays is? Sunday is two fifty. If you get it at home, it's a dollar eighty-five. Now, the Washington Post decided years ago not to be a, let's say, international or national paper. You, you're, you're, you're trying to, not kind of trying to compete with the New York Times, really, in some respects. Is that correct? I think that's the wrong way to put it. We, okay. we don't compete with the New York Times because their model is totally different, right. right? They distribute their edition across the country. They're really serving, you know, a very narrow slice of elite America. Right. They have a very small circulation base here. Um, so we are a local paper in the sense that we do not distribute the Washington Post in print form outside of the Washington area. But probably because we are in Washington, because of my grandmother and my uncle and our reputation through Watergate and whatnot, we have a national and international brand. And we see that when our reporters go all over the world, people know and care about the Washington Post. We have foreign bureaus. We have since Ben Bradley set them up. We cover the nation and the world through a Washington lens. So we serve the local audience who may want to know about, you know, what's going on in the Fairfax school system, but we also write about the White House. You know, our audience is also the Hill. So we actually serve both audiences. We just use the internet, right. that newfangled tool to reach people outside of Washington. Now, some of your respective predecessors have written publicly that They've had calls and meetings with the President of the United States saying, don't publish this. And sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Has the President called you or National Security Advisor, Secretary of State said, don't publish anything you want to tell us you should have published? Or that hasn't happened since you've been doing these jobs? It probably hasn't happened to you yet, has it? Are you? Not yet. I can't wait, though. Okay. <laughs> It, it has happened during my watch. It doesn't usually rise up to me. It usually rises up to the editor. Um, and I, wh what I would say is we always listen. We get advice and we listen seriously. If somebody says this is going to jeopardize national security or people's lives, we don't take that at face value. But if, if there's something, you know, and then we have to weigh, and you could speak better about this, but the value of the right. news and whether or not, like for example, when um, Dana Priest did the top secret America story about all the defense contractors who work with the government, at one it was all based on public information, all of it. And at one point we had a database including this address specific location of all of these defense contractors. The government asked us to take out the address specific part right. for security reasons. And we did because we thought the actual address of the place was really not newsworthy. Right. So if I wanted to get my uh, view known in Washington or I wanted to advertise in Washington, what, what would you say you to somebody? You call me collect. 
Okay, what is the best thing about why somebody should advertise in the Washington Post versus the New York Times, Washington Edition, or USA Today, or, or television? Why should somebody advertise in the Washington Post? Because it works. I'm not kidding. It works. It drives feet to stores. You know, we have a ton of advertisers, and it's not because of charity. It's be and they watch it. I mean, people say you can't track it in print. That is totally not true. They track it. They pull the ads in. They put special numbers in. We did a pizza ad, and we got a call from Papa John saying, you have to stop it. We don't have that many pizzas. I mean, <laughs> I am not kidding. OK, it was a free pizza, but nevertheless. Um, <laughs> no, they work, right? right. Um, they drive feet to stores. And, you know, the New York Times is a totally different. Like, if you want to have a big splashy movie ad, you know, for your ego or whatever, you can advertise okay. in the Times. So what's the greatest pleasure of being the Washington Post publisher? It's working with people like Marty in the newsroom, honestly. Everyone in the building, me, the business side, anybody in accounting, the security guard, are so proud to be a part of what we do, to get up every morning to see the stories that you may have expected or may not have expected, you know, the day after Obama's first election, my best friend called me and she was like, I'm crying. I'm crying. You have to read this story by Will Haygood. I hadn't read it yet. I read it. I mean, I was crying too. It's that it's really, you read Eli Saslow's story last week on the food stamp program. I mean, they're incredible and they have impact. Right. And the greatest pleasure of being the editor of the Post is what? It's the same. It's the journalism that we do. Uh, the ability to do journalism that has uh, incredible impact, uh, that affects people's lives, that reflects people's lives. And uh, that's the most satisfying thing, and we get to do that every single day. But, you know, you're following the tradition of Ben Bradley and other distinguished people had this job, so is that a hard job to kind of follow, or? Uh, well, if you put it that way. Um, <laughs> the, um, no, it's, uh, look, uh, they, they built the institution. I, I have great reverence for what they accomplished at the Washington Post. It's, incre it's incredible. Uh, I'm not intimidated by it. I'm inspired by it. And I would hope to live up to the same standards that they upheld. Does Ben Bradley call you with advice from time to time, or not? Mm -hmm. so he is not. <laughs> no, okay. He's not, okay. although we've gotten together. So, all right, anybody who wants to know something about the Washington Post or why they should advertise there or anything else about stories that you wish they would write but they haven't yet written about you, uh, raise your hand. And uh, any questions? Gary, is that a hand? Gary Shapiro. Okay. Gary Shapiro, the Consumer Electronics Association. Uh, one subject you haven't touched on, David, it's a little maybe sensitive. Obviously, there's a perception that the Washington Post is fairly left and liberal. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's clearly from the editorial pages that's obvious. And, and your readers appear to be, based on the comments that are written on your stories. Do you intend to try to change that perception, whether or not you think it's real in the front of the paper? Uh, so, uh, I have nothing Gentle to do. on Obama, things like that. Right, well, we're not, uh, first of all, you were talking, you mentioned the editorial page, which I have nothing whatsoever to do with. So, uh, that's, that's completely separate. As far as our news coverage is concerned, uh, it is not, it's not ideological. Uh, we have, just in the time that I've been here, for example, we've been investigating Senator Menendez, a Democrat, and, uh, and we've been investigating the governor of Virginia, who's a Republican. So uh, we're happy to investigate anybody. Uh, but, um, and um, it's, it's non-ideological. When I was in Boston, we, the Speaker of the House uh, and is today in federal prison because of an investigation that was done by the Boston Globe. Uh, and everybody said it was a liberal, liberal newspaper, and he was a Democrat, supported liberal positions right down the road, uh, every single liberal position. So I couldn't care less. Uh, we should just do our jobs and call the facts as we see them. And I think with the key word that you mentioned was perception. Uh, and a lot of the perception is formed by what people's pre-existing point of view is. Uh, and uh, that's not something that I can control, uh, but I would hope that as people look at our coverage over a long period of time, uh, or even an intermediate period of time, and they look at the range of coverage, they would see that we're not, we're not uh, applying this through an ideological lens. What? Catherine, you agree the I, perception is that you're left of center? The perception is, is I, th I think, applies to all print media. Um, well, not the Wall Street Journal, because of their editorial page and because they cover business and because Rupert Murdoch is the owner. Um, on the editorial page, I actually get a lot of attacked a lot for it being too conservative. Um, and if you look at our op-ed page, we have Charles Krauthammer, we have George Will, we have Jennifer Rubin, we have plenty of conservative voices. I had a woman when I was speaking somewhere 
who was angry that we have moved a little more to the center or to the right, depending on your, on your point of view. We recommended going into Iraq at the time. And she said she used to have a bumper sticker on her car in the 70s that said, thank God for the Washington Post. And she's like, what happened to that Washington Post? So we're not liberal enough for her. So you know, the editorial page, they write their own views that are consistent with those of Don and myself, but they, as Marty said, have nothing to do with the rest well, of our the, coverage. Uh, the decision to endorse President Obama, I guess, twice, was that a, did that take a long time in the debate for the editorial board, or I was pretty obvious it was going to get done that way? I mean, they always take it very seriously, that job, and uh, they weigh it and they discuss it, and, and they certainly consider Romney seriously. They obviously made the decision right. to endorse Obama, but, you know. Okay. Other questions? Anyone else? Here, right here, Chris Ullman. Hi, I'm Chris Ullman at the Carlisle Group. Um, Marty, if you come back here in five years, how will we know if you've succeeded? Meaning you've joined at a time of great flux. What is your mandate and what are some of the metrics or changes or that will determine whether or not you've succeeded and um, the right decision was made to bring you in? Right, well, that's a good question. Um, Maybe Catherine should answer that. But the, um, I think I would, it would be succeeded on uh, two different levels. One is on the journalistic level, that you would be able to look back at uh, uh, the range of coverage and see that we have uh, done stories that have had an impact and that have mattered in people's lives and have, have uh, helped people become better, better citizens and, and held significant institutions and individuals accountable. Uh, and on the business side of things, that we are well positioned for the future, that we are on stable ground uh, financially, uh, that, we, that we have a good future, uh, that future is likely to be digital, and that we have transformed ourselves for, for uh, the digital environment which we are living in today and which we're likely to be living in even more so in, in the future. Okay, other questions? Yes, back here. Joe Brudecki, Bernstein. Joe Brudecki, Bernstein, Global Wealth Management. What makes a good journalist? Um, uh, why do I get all the questions? Uh, the, um, Cause your this questions is not are fair. very interesting. It's not fair. Uh, the, um, what makes a good journalist? I think somebody who approaches, uh, their work with sort of, who is honest, honorable, fair, thorough, and, and accurate. Uh, those, are the, that's what's required. Uh, every time you go into a story, you go in with some sort of, there's a reason you're pursuing a story. It's not just a subject, there's a storyline attached to it. And you, you come in with some sort of hypothesis as to what the story is. But you always have to sort of look at the underlying facts, say, you know, do they support it, they don't support it, that sort of thing. And, uh, and be honest uh, about it and be fair. And, uh, and be honorable in your dealings with, uh, with other people and be accurate. And ultimately, I think to tell the truth as, you, as best you can determine it. Uh, and those are the qualities that I look for in journalists. Those are the qualities that I hope that I uh, uphold personally. And uh, that's what we try to do every day. Okay. One more question. I got to have the final question. I'll do There's it myself. Oh, okay, back. back here. Sorry. Harriet Edelman, New York Private Bank of Trust. Just curious about, as you reflect on a story that perhaps you didn't think was going to go anywhere, but took off beyond your wildest dreams in terms of how it resonated with the public or picked up by other papers, and then conversely, a story that you thought would go and just didn't and left you perplexed. Boy, that's a, that's a tough one. I, I have actually thought about uh, that. Um, because your judgment's always right each exactly. time. You don't have the, you're not surprised, right? Uh, you know, it, I think I, it's just—it's hard for me to say the story that we that we have pursued that didn't really go anywhere, or a story that I expected to go somewhere that, that fell flat. I, I'm I'm coming up short. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Oh. Catherine, final question: What was the best advice your grandmother gave you when you were growing up about being in the business world or doing the kind of job she had that you remember? You know, I when I was growing up with her, she was more like grandma, so I didn't. I don't think she gave me business advice. My, the best advice I've ever gotten was actually from Don when it, uh, he was talking to me about taking bigger and bigger jobs, may, maybe before I was becoming publisher, and I was really nervous about it. And he said, Catherine, and he said he got this from Warren, uh, he said, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, you just have to surround yourself with the smartest people and listen. 
and that was the best advice I've ever gotten. Mm -hmm. All right, on that, I want to thank you both for your appearance here today, and I think we learned a lot more about the Washington Post, and I have a gift for you from the Economic Club, and I assume a journalist can take a gift. Is that okay? Depends, Depends what it how is. much it is. Uh, okay. actually. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay. Awesome. Okay. 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 Okay.